printing the paper, newspaper back on the way down? No, we have the cable station. Oh, oh that's right, the cable station. Yes, sir. A few times, and I've known Percy for a long time. Okay. I remember being back in... He's passed away. Yeah, oh, yeah, I know. We did an, they did an exercise back there, and Carl Hubble was in charge of it. And they were doing something uh, on the railhead. And I remember they caught two of them, and one young lad was working in the mines. He didn't understand English too well, and the guys that they caught were talking, and he said, no talk, no talk, and they kept on talking, so he jabbed them with the bayonet. That got the message across pretty quick. So <laughs> Mr. Hubbard said, no, you talk, you no talk. Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, all of them, 1863 and 1862. Your 63 was at the 16th Prince Edward. The battalion is 1863 too. So it's, the history kind of goes, but it actually goes back. Either the Belleville Rifles or Belleville Bicycle Brigade or something. And each little community had their own little group. And they circled the city from what we found and then it ended up as the 15th battalion and that ended up in the 15th Argyle. 30th ah. was built for the 15th Argyle. Good heavens. It's right on the cornerstone. So that's our family tree over there. The swords down here are was the uh, Prime Minister of Canada for a short while, not very long, but uh, for a short while. The regiment. Uh, the 16th Prince Everett and the 49 Hastings Rifles were amalgamated in 1920 to make the Hastings and Prince Everett Regiment. And they, one of the officers, I think, from Picton, put the two badges together to come up with the Hasty P hat badge. So it's a combination of the two badges. Uh, the pictures are people in the uh, 16th Prince Everett typical uniforms that they had, similar uh, but different. Uh, this picture up here is, uh, if you remember Belvo anything a long time ago, was the old police station over here in Market Square. It actually was a courtroom, it was a butcher store, it's been many things and right now uh, it's showing the uh, uh, 15th uh, Battalion. And we've got pictures of them riding bicycles. So that's and they are in a rifle regiment um, uniform, typical infantry. And this is 49th, 49th rifles over here. <coughs> Got the rifle green. A typical type of uh, weapon that they had at the time. And you put the bayonet on the rifle, and it's probably taller than most of the men that would have the thing. It's that big. Two of them are from the. Uh, no, they're not. They're uh, in the Irwin. Uh, but some of this stuff come from Barlow. Is in is one of these people in here. Uh, this particular stuff here come from the Barlow family. The uh, the beanie, and the cartridge belt, and the satchel. And they, you'll find that these people have it on too. This collection of medals here is of the Northwest Rebellion, and it actually come from a gentleman that on the Midland Battalion uh, and it, the Midland kind of carried, took in from uh, Cornwall as far as Port Hope and north to Lindsay in the area up in there. Each small unit would send their people that wanted to go out west up to Port Hope and they would form companies and they went out west on the train. There's a picture of them on the train here. Uh, from what we understand, they went as far as they could by train. And when it stopped going, they got out and they went by lumber wagon and walked. And this was in December, too. Right. So it was a lot of snow and it was cold. Now, maybe five years ago, we were in uh, Saskatoon and uh, we went out to Batoche. It's a national historic site. It actually looks very similar to what that uh, is the uh, 15th Argyle. Uh, similar type of, you know, same color, same leather belts, very similar. The difference being the uh, the Argyle 
they wore that little checkerboard around mm -hmm. their hats, and when in later years they had it behind their hat badge on their berets. And this gentleman here, actually from the county, uh, he was in the Boer War. Oh. The Boer War. The Boer Go War. Uh, let's see, now go over here, Vandewater Estate, uh, it, uh, Colonel Vandewater uh, was with the, let's see now, he was with the 49th Hastings Rifles before the war, first war that is, he joined the 39th Battalion and went overseas with them, and as normal most of these battalions were split up and he ended up with the 2nd Battalion, which was commonly referred to as the Big Iron Two. And all the stuff that he has, the saddle, uh, the bridle, uh, his uniform, the buttons, are all 2nd Battalion. They got the maple leaf with Big Two on it, same with the hat badge, uh, the little silver things on the, uh, the harness here. We've had uh, one of his grandsons was in to help us set up some of this stuff. And he said, yeah, granddad was there for pretty well the whole length of time. And when he came home, he actually had a horse. And the picture up in here, you can't see it from this mannequin here. The horse was with him during the war. He wanted to bring it home with him, and they wouldn't let him. They had other ideas what they were going to do with him. And he knew what they were, so he took it on the horse. And when he got off, he shot it and had it buried so that they couldn't use it for glue or whatever, or food or whatever else they were doing. Good. So he was, uh, but this is a list of here uh, that says the uh, nominal role of a uh, senior role of the officers, the, the reorganized uh, fifth light infantry in 1919. And here's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Roscoe Vandewater. When he came back, he went to the Argyle. Uh, there's some other uh, Wills, Vermilier, Gein. Uh, there's another Gein, Payne, Gribble, Green. All kinds of names that are synonymous to the, the. Somebody actually wrote a little a musical piece for Colonel Van der Water, which is down here. We didn't realize this until we grandson was showing us this. But the grandson had said all of the kids learned to ride on this saddle. And it was the hardest saddle that he ever sat in. Isn't that something? And I'm okay. And the, the Vandewater estate is in Chatterton. Mm -hmm. When you, you go you're coming from Foxburn down and the road goes around this way, there's a little white house up in the long well, that was the Vandewater estate. Oh, and that's where all this we got all this stuff from. These uniforms in here are just typical uniforms. First war, map board, binoculars, a little light. Uh, the trend of the maps that are here are they're more like oil cloth, so that they're waterproof. Hmm. We've got oh, boxes of them upstairs, the Vandewater stuff. And we have in here Rifle grenades have a little turbine on them. When they're fired and they go through the air, they whistle. It's supposed to scare people. Imagine they did. The boots here are trench boots. And we had Colonel Bada was in looking at it, and he got a hold of them. He started spreading them apart. And he says, "I know exactly where they're made." And anybody, he's a shoemaker by trade. He know exactly. Yes, David. Yes. And he was you talking. He knew exactly where those boots were made but the sole of them is full of hobnails. It's like a little star nail about that big around. They're covered in them, and the heel has got a big horseshoe plate onto it and hobnails made right into the heel. So they're, I've never seen them quite like that before. They're quite uh, different. Again, it's just artifacts. Uh, a lot of them in the Vandewater estate. Uh, the wire is here from the Western Front. Uh, the whistle, there's one here, and there's actually one on Van Der they're both his. One of them he used to uh, start the raid on Vimy for his group that he had. And he also had a, quite a reputation of uh, 
bringing people back, and everybody knew that they, that they went. If they went with Van der Water, they'd always come back. So everybody wanted to go with Van der Water, and he was, he was quite well known to, for that. Uh, the brown items in here we call death pennies, and one of the things that the government actually sent when your uh, son, father, husband, or whatever died, uh, along with a nice little uh, letter, uh, we got this with a name on it, and I think the intention was you can put it up in your house or you can put it on the tombstone, whatever most mm -hmm. people do. We actually have a, one over here that's addressed to the Belleville Army. We just got this last year from the Mitchells. Uh, we live in Rossmore, and then the council, what's the connection? Their father, grandfather was the janitor and lived in the, the apartment on the third floor, and their son went overseas, and uh, he was killed overseas. And so they mm -hmm. sent it was addressed to the Belleville Armies. The picture, we've got quite a few different ones. This one is of the, I think it's the 155th, yeah, 155th Battalion. Uh, and from what I understand, it says it went out at Kingston, but it was raised in the Quinney area, and they did their training down in, in Kingston. Uh, most of them, when they got overseas, were split up, and they went to other line units. The flag that's up here is the last one flown on Vimy Ridge, last Canadian ensign. And we got it thanks to our, uh, with my honorary Lieutenant Colonel Gord Way, who worked for Veterans Affairs, and that was his, one of his responsibilities, to make sure the flags were in good shape. And uh, he said that was the last one, and we have it. And we got the rest of them that he had in his safe. I think there's about six of them upstairs that size. He had to make sure that the Maple Leaf got put up. The uniform here is on a junior mannequin, and that's the size of, uh, they might have been little people. This item up here is a kite. Uh, from what we understand, uh, the Canadians used square box kites. The Germans knew what they were and would shoot them down. Somebody designed this thing that, to make it look like a hawk. And they must have survived because we have this. And it, Damn it. Well, that's what that is. <laughs> more First War pictures. Uh, German artifacts in here. Uh, potato, and there's a potato mash or grenade. That's First War version. Some more First War items. French water bottle. This is Canadian telegrapher's key. Uh, there's the key down there. This picture, we think, was taken in Kingston. Because the, if you look at the train, it's kind of going around a bend. And the Kingston is about the only one that we know of that is local that had that bend in the track, the old track, not the new one. Uh, let's see, the flag there is from the Yaka Kennedy, no, this is the artillery one, 34th Cooney Artillery Association. This is a, a, a cape, again from the Van Water Estate, uh, which they wore, it's kind of, you know, heavy wool. Wouldn't keep it too warm though, would it? No, wouldn't keep the rain, uh, well, wouldn't keep the rain off, it would soak up, but it would have the 34th battery that was amalgamated into the unit. Um, there's other German artifacts down here, field telephones, more artillery in here, a mine detecting device, second war version. These three pictures that are up here were actually that size when we they brought them in. We took them down to the photocopier and he blew them up 400 percent and we find that we've got a, a 1500 weight and a, we think a six pounder artillery or any tank gun mm -hmm. out in the field someplace in Europe. Senior officers uh, would be in a staff position in the headquarters. Uh, they would simply, you know, it was his wardrobe, he kept everything in there. If you were in the field, you didn't have that type uniform. These shoulder badges here are the ones that were worn during the war. I think this may be the la la latest one. And these are the start down here. One of them is actually canvas here. Edenworth, which is now the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment. Uh, again, a typical post-war 
battle dress uh, from the Midland Regiment. The Midland Regiment were amalgamated in the 50s, I think it was, the HDPs. And they never went overseas. Uh, they did uh, border guard, RCAF guard, and one of the companies did go to Hong Kong, but they did on their, apparently on their own. There's a list of them there that uh, went over. Artifacts in here, Second War. Uh, the P-38 that's there is a replica. But it's, we still have to cable it down. The box down in underneath there that looks like a cigar box yes. is for ashes. We didn't know this. We had uh, we belonged to the Organization of Military Museums of Canada, and they used to bring over a German officer uh, who was a retired CEO of an armored unit, had five museums under his control after his retirement. And he said, oh no, he said, if the soldier was killed, then he was, was cremated and the asses were put in the box and sent home. Oh, oh, that's, that's an efficient way to do it. Exactly. Yeah. The flag up here, when it was captured by Bill Graydon uh, and his company, they signed it all and they always thought it was a Nazi flag. But this uh, German officer said, no, no, he says it's a convoy flag. He said, you know, all, all the Canadian vehicles had white stars painted on them? I said, yes. He said, well, we had the same problem. So he said, we used to fly these big flags amongst the vehicles in their convoys. So the Germans didn't shoot their own guys. Now, this is a typical uh, type of storm shorts, uh, khaki shirt, ankle boots, the water bottle and the ammo pouches, the helmet, uh, the sewing kit that they had, called the housewife. Then we have the uh, CWAC uniform. And this is a, a route. This was done by one of the COs. Uh, it was in the electronics business. It depicts where we landed in Pekino on 10th of July, 40, 43, I believe it was, and all up through Italy uh, to the top, and then they were sent from there back around to Holland uh, to go in there, so they finished off the war in Holland. It was the first of the big operations that was called Operation Husky long before D-Day. Now here, the typical band uniform, we actually did have a band. They were quite good. Uh, they act actually were invited to the Rose Bowl parade down in California. They didn't get to go because the colonel fired them. Because they started telling the colonel what they were going to do and what they weren't going to do. So, <laughs> you're gone. Uh, this is Colonel Sutcliffe's uniform. He was the only commanding officer was killed during the war. Uh, we don't have his medal, his daughter has his uh, picture. Um, all the other artifacts that a lot of them would have during the war. This down here is uh, the picture of the Morrow River uh, Canadian War Cemetery in Artona, where the Major Campbell, the Major Campbell wrote this prayer before battle, which is quite famous. And not too long ago, we had a call from somebody in uh, Quebec. They had Major Campbell's uh, wedge cap and his forage cap. And apparently that's his forage cap because his name is penciled inside. It's Italian made, so he's, he was from Italy. We had no idea where he got it, but that's uh, where it come from. And this up here is a collection of gas masks. We believe that it's up to date, uh, starting with the, the first of them, this down here, to this, and then over to here. This was a civilian version of it here, and then that second war, and then this is what they, over here, they use right now. And this one is a second model of it. They put a vent in the front. The other ones didn't have a vent in it, mm -hmm. and it's a wool material. And what they found was the mustard gas if they urinated on this, the urine, the acid in the urine would cut the mustard gas and it wouldn't affect them. Yeah, that'd be kind of yeah. messy. Okay. They not want to do that. But that, if they want to survive, that's what they did. And now here we have a, a nursing 
sister's uh, display. One of the ladies in town here uh, collects uh, uniform and memorabilia from all the nurses that were trained at the uh, Edith Cavell Block in Belleville. Uh, First War and Second War. Uh, from what we understand, this is a First War uniform. I'm not sure because these are Second War medals. Uh, this certainly is Second War, but these pictures are of the general hospitals that they were in. And of course we have the medals down here. We used to have them in the big sliding drawer, but we find that you can see them down here. You don't have to handle them or open the drawer. And they're there. And we have, uh, if you look at these, uh, the silver cross. If your son or husband was killed, the mother would get a, a silver cross and the wife would get a silver cross if uh, he was married. These two were found on eBay. Somebody in their great wisdom seen they were hasty peas, so they were purchased and we have them in here. That's why the Silver Cross Mother at the center tap on That's right, yeah, that's, that's what that means. The one down at the bottom is, is uh, from a gentleman, a retired police officer in Toronto. His father was in the hasty peas, was killed overseas, and that was his mother's Silver Cross. Your Hubble War. This is what they call a, an invasion vest, but it's very similar uh, in design to the load-carrying vest that they have now. The Second War, we're now in the Afghanistan War, so there's quite a few years difference, but it still does the same thing, carries the extra equipment. Everybody that was in Britain before D-Day was issued one. That's how we got one of our officers was there, and he was issued that, never did wear it, but uh, he did have. General Graham was the uh, first war vet, and he enlisted, went to the second war. He was a company commander in, in Trenton, and uh, helped raise the, the battalion. An overseas commander in the unit overseas, uh, got to be a brigade commander over there. Go back to Canada, he actually was the Chief of General Staff for a while before he retired, and then he took on the Toronto Stock Exchange for a retirement project, I gather. Homegrown, there's not many reserve officers that get that far up in the, uh, mm -hmm. the regular forest world. The Venus, uh, there's a picture of the original big chief, the pewter one that was on the canning factory in Picton that they took off the roof and brought it down. And this is the, the current issue. Uh, who was, he was carved by Abe Patterson in Pembroke and sent overseas. He didn't go to war, but he was stored someplace and uh, brought back when they come back with the, the unit. The first battle flag that Angus Duffy uh, Put together made and we found it upstairs and it was stapled to a stiff piece of cardboard and put in a picture frame it had been there so long that the paint from the uh, cap edge adhered right to the glass so we've, we've taken it out it's in our, an archival frame right now so we're, we're okay this is a model that we did after the boys come back from Cape and they visited a uh, our guys decided they were going to do a model of a sorrel it's, uh, it's quite typical. Um, we've got a lot of pictures. And when one of the vets, Bob Wigmore, was in every day that they were making this to make sure that they got it right. Because he was there. He was actually one of the boys that climbed up the back side of it. The sorrow was, they tried two or three times to take it coming this way. So Colonel Sutt down here was given the order to do it. When he was doing his recce, he was killed along with the intelligence officer. So it went from him to uh, Tweedsmere. And John Tweedsmere, he decided, and I think he'd already talked to Sutcliffe, they were going to come up the back side of it, which is around the back side here. Straight up, 2,800 feet. They climbed it in the middle of the night. They never made a sound. They hauled themselves, their ammunition, some food, and a rifle, and a radio. We don't have the radio, it's in the carrier right now, but the batteries weigh as much as these 
weights that we put together down here and the radio was quite large. They managed to get it up there. They, even today they still don't know how they got up there because it's, it's a feat that they don't understand. When they got to the back side of this mountain, they found there was a hundred foot gully. In front. So they had to go down before they went up. So they got down and went, they climbed up. And they surprised the Germans and held the top. They were there for three days. They just about didn't make it, but it, they were fortunate that they had the radio. And one of the officers was trained in artillery spotting. And they had a good set of binoculars. And every time the Germans way down there would fire up here, they'd catch where the smoke was coming from, radio the position back to the Canadian artillery, and they would take it out. The Germans finally decided maybe we better leave. So they did. And we have a cave, and I, I didn't realize this either. I thought when we were in uh, Asoro, there was a little cave that you could go in, up in, and it goes up inside this Norman castle. Uh, Wigmore said, no, he said it's over the side. There was a cave on the backside where all the wounded went. So they didn't, they weren't in direct fire of the artillery of the, the Germans firing up at them. It was done by the nuns, and I can't remember the name of the place it was done in. Uh, the old fellows would remember. But it was all hand stitched by nuns. We have a flag upstairs that was uh, done by the crew of the ship that they were taken from Britain to Aquino, and they made this. It's a huge thing. We had it displayed over in Picton one year. Monstrous, but it was flown from the ship. Isn't that uh, something? That'd be something. Uh, the Jones boy. Not Carl, but uh, Bert. Jones Motors back in Maida. Yes. This was presented by Bert. Uh, Bert uh, got involved with the Quinney veterans and uh, he found that from, uh, what was this, Dafo. We called him Dude Dafo, from Madoff. And he apparently used to blow this, and they let him in the unit. He was too young, but if he could learn to play this thing, they let him in the unit, which he did. And then apparently he went overseas with him. So that horn was Dude Dafo's. The bird presented to us before he died. Uh, we got it out of the Veteran, many Veterans Museum time getting it back. Uh, some artifacts around the walls. This is the last of the Argyle uh, China and silverware. Uh, they, the Argyle chapter of the IOD folded maybe 10 years ago. Most of them have. I think there's one still in Peterborough, but and that's the last of the China that they had. Uh, their charter up there. We have a little gift shop here. Uh, we have uh, videos of the, uh, there's DHS and DVDs uh, the regiment. The trip to Italy is over there. Uh, there's the book done by General Graham, a uh, citizen and soldier. We have several other books down here, one from Bert, uh, Ray Langstaff and George Ponsford, and then our honors and awards book that we have. And we've redone the book of the regiment. It's all been redone. Uh, just oh, been redone. Yeah. We've added pictures to it and uh, a list of all the members that went through the unit. And we got a bunch of models and more horns over here. And some other pictures. That's the Belleville Armories with the Opera Theater up which hasn't been around for years. And this picture up here is uh, members of the 27th Brigade when they're in Germany in 51. And they have the, the son of little chief up there. He's just a little wooden Indian made by the same person that made this one out here. And this in here is our weapons vault. We can't display them because we don't have the proper display cases yet, but we're working on it. We've been working on it for quite a while. And they got to be special. Yeah. And it was kind of um, acquired by some of the members before the unit came home from Italy, or Holland. Uh, they figured the chief needed a wife. Some guys decided to carve one, and the Colonel Duffy said, it's a horrible looking thing, and it was. And they somehow or other acquired this one from a campground. And when the unit come down 
Pinnacle Street, where the Pinnacle Playhouse is now, we used to be the Sally Ann. It was on one side of the dais and the chief was on the other side of the dais. And right now, 